Dr. Sergei Solovki, the first deputy director of the New Europe Center. So, uh, in this way, New Europe Center is represented by, by two well-known experts, not only in Ukraine, but even abroad. Thank you, and have a good discussion. Thank you for introduction. Uh, and it was really great honor for New Europe Center uh, to co-organize a forum to take part in brainstorming uh, on New Europe partnership, I would even say. Uh, and it's great honor for me to introduce uh, our uh, presenter of case study on Moldova, uh, Dumitru Mindarari, who is associate expert, Institute for European Policies and Reforms from Moldova. Uh, his paper is really unique and really interesting because it is not only about uh, Moldovan uh, experience in a uh, security realm, but uh, it is somehow also uh, a document which has a summary, a generalization of situation in our region. And in particular, there is a very interesting concept on uh, three doors to conquer uh, not only territories, but minds and hearts of people, annexing them. So, glory to you. And then you are very welcome to take part in the uh, discussion. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, share my ideas with you. And I look forward uh, for the uh, Q&A section. Uh, since I'm jet lagged, I'm not going to risk to improvise. So I will just go over uh, the material that I prepared uh, for you. Uh, I'd like to start by pointing out to you a uh, some Moldovan recent news piece that surprised me. Uh, the national media reported that Moldovan Security and Intelligence Service deconstructed a pro-Russian paramilitary group disguised as a tactical war games paintball club. Uh, the authorities linked them to the pro-Russian separatists in Donbas and found some modest weapon cache uh, that they uh, supposedly were to operate. Uh, this example serves uh, a, as a remind reminder that Ukraine is not an exceptional case in the uh, types of threats that it faces. And uh, it also emphasizes a few of the weaknesses uh, of Moldovan law enforcement uh, that would be referred to the, uh, in the presentation, but especially emphasized in the paper. Um, I, I know that I, I, uh, you are a sophisticated audience and that you are well aware of many things uh, that my research is discussing. Uh, so as a talk, token of respect to your time, I am going to instead uh, just talk about something a bit less usual in the current circumstances. Uh, the motivation that guided me uh, through examining the current security risks affecting uh, Moldova and Eastern Europe in general. Um, if we look back in time before 2014, the experts and policymakers in the West uh, tended to largely discard Russia as a military power uh, or threat. Uh, they viewed NATO military capabilities being superior to Russia's, and they had in mind a specific understanding of how these military capabilities matter. To paraphrase that, they had a specific opinion about how military capabilities transfer into victory. At the same time, they discarded the aggressive intern towards neighbors that Russia has signaled on various occasions. Uh, one of this was the 2008 war against Georgia. Uh, the classical risk assessment model suggests that we consider both capabilities and intent before ringing the alarm bell. The Russian aggression against Ukraine suggested our security risk assessment approach seemed to be flawed. The flaw I'm referring to is the erroneous perception of how military capabilities transfer into victory or how the military instrument can be used to advance political goals. It is a result of this, I'd like to claim, that we failed to pre preempt the Russia's stealthy model of foreign aggression explored in Ukraine. And in my presentation, this is the terminology I'm going to use in referring to interchangeably with the so-called hybrid uh, uh, threats or hybrid war. Uh, because of the qualities of this uh, stealthy aggression and its potential effect to disrupt the rule-based order and boldly redraw international borders, I'd like to claim that it is a new nuclear bomb in the social real by its effectiveness. The process widely labeled as hybrid war is nothing less than a model of stealthy political assimilation of new countries 
and operates as a modern conflict technology that replaces military territorial annexation. In the conventional type of wars, uh, if the conventional type of wars have been aiming at conquering territory in order to control the citizens, the new type of wars aim to conquer the citizen in order to achieve control over the territory as a result. But why should we all care and not leave that issue to worry about to the countries that were perhaps unfortunate to evolve in the Russia's vicinity? It, it is for a very simple reason. The success of this Russian model of stealthy aggression would encourage its further use, including against EU countries. And to deter it, I'd like to claim that EU should make a priority to generate prohibitive costs for its use in Moldova. My focus on Moldova is not because I have conducted the security assessment on this country and because I, I happen to be a Moldovan citizen. It is my understanding that Moldova is the next Ukraine simply because Russia perceives it as, as a less costly place to conduct this kind of aggression and thus because it's less costly it's more attractive as a policy option. To reduce the reduced costs are due to a specific set of conditions that I will elaborate on later. It is only if we make it fail that we can naturally bring the Russian leadership to the idea that such approaches are not worth pursuing. The recent revelations in the public space that Russia may have been involved in assisting the emergence into power of the anti-European and populist government in Hungary and Poland should force us to think about the dog that did not bark. What are the other type of hybrid aggression operations that Russia conducted and which we have not been able to detect. How can we separate then a genuine political transformation from one which was planned and methodically implemented with control from abroad? While I have conducted my case research on Moldova, the key goal of my analysis is to identify the essential structure of the specific conflict technology of what we refer to as hybrid war. The expression conflict technology is a technical jargon in war studies that refer to underlying dynamic of a coercive activity or conflict. Let me use a metaphor. The largest breakthroughs in our ability to cure diseases happened after we understood the coercive technology that the pathogen used to fool and attack our immune system. And cancer research is a vivid example of this. <coughs> Currently, I have the feeling that we are similar to the six blind men in a room trying to learn and what an elephant is. Each of us touches just one part of the elephant body and make claims of what the elephant looks like based on the parts of the body that we have access to. We have different countries focusing on very specific threats, like interference into elections, cyber attacks, propaganda and disinformation, just to name a few. During the very short time that I was a Secretary of State for Defense Policy and International Cooperation with the Moldova Minister of Defense, I was surprised to see how hybrid war meant something different for different foreign interlocutors that I had depending on what they saw as most challenging to their national security. My analysis suggests that all of this are just the tools. In our efforts to counter the Russia's hybrid war, which I refer to as stealthy Russian aggression, we are focusing on countering just separate approaches of foreign aggression. Instead, we should understand the aggression mechanism and create obstacles towards the goals that this aggression is aiming to achieve. Please let me share with you my proposed image of this stealthy aggression. The ultimate goal of aggression is to control a target country's sovereignty. This was the case when a country's military invaded another. It is also the case when a country installs a puppet regime in another country. Why is this so? Imagine sovereignty as a room that can be accessed by three doors. These doors are territory, political leadership and institution, and population. We view war solely as capturing sovereignty through taking control over the foreign territory. I'd like to suggest that identical goals can be achieved by taking control over the other two elements, people or political leaders and institution. The difference is in the costs involved, so that a resolved aggressor can choose one of these approaches depending on the cost it is ready to bear, including the comparative advantage any of these tools offer. Some of these approaches may be better suited for a country if it does not, if it has a weak military, for instance, or if it has capabilities uh, to control the population of another country. The reason why I suggested Moldova is, is due to the fact that it is in Moldova that Russia has mostly advanced in taking control over the two of the three elements of sovereignty, 
except the territory. As a self-appointed war theorist, I'm tempted to explore abstract thinking. Please let me depart from this and offer you a snapshot into how I, I, the principle I described is explored in Moldova. I suggest that there are three main strategies that Russia uses in Moldova to advance its self-aggression designs and take control of the Moldova sovereignty. These are, the one of them is replacement of values, another one is seizing political elites and institutions, and the third one is faking the resolution of the Transnistrian conflict. Uh, let me explain how each of these works. Based on behavioral economics and cognitive psychology research, we know that we can influence the perception and thus the values of the people. This is done in the following way. Russia has a significant penetration of the Moldovan economic space, and this allows us to inflict changes to the economic and social environment of Moldovan citizens. Or, through its economic policies, including tariffs and sanctions, it is able to greatly affect the welfare, the well-being of the Moldovans. This uh, opens the ground for the second step, affecting the basic needs of the Moldovans. So, when you live in a poor environment, your needs, they, they evolve. If, if yesterday a Moldovan preferred to advocate for the individual freedoms, as a result of the changed economic environment, she may prefer to ensure the economic survival of herself and her family. A third step is that the change needs lead to an alteration of individual preferences. Finally, changing preferences lead to an alteration of values. This finalizes the cycle that I refer to as the replacement of values. The strategy allows Russia to take control over the affected population. For instance, in Moldova, this has resulted in people generally not penalizing corruption of the elites if they believe this elites share with them the corruption spoils. For those who monitor Moldova, you could see evidence for this in people's opinion voiced through media. This explains the emergence of phenomena like uh, Shore, Ilan Shore. And this can explain the blackmailing of President Dodon after his recent visit to Moscow, when he conditioned natural gas, gas prices from Russia and agricultural exports to Russia with the so-called a correct vote in the forthcoming parliamentary elections. A related strategy of sovereignty capture is acquiring control over political elites and institutions. This can be done through both the knowledge of target, can, can be done both with the knowledge of the target elites or with them being ignorant of it. It includes creating dependencies of the target political elites to Russia. Those often originates through economic favors, but also creating and exploring vulnerabilities among the target elites. It is through them that the institutions then are being captured. In the case of Moldova, an example of what seems to be a captured institution is the presidency. At least among other public speakers, uh, public figures, Speaker Andrian Kangel suggested this in some of his statements, and he's a very informed person that encourages us to listen to what he says. Another example that I use in the study is the so-called laundromat. I claim that Moldovan actors were lured into the scheme to generate control over extra revenues for the Russian elites. And then this situation is being used against them to blackmail them and to control them. So the political and economic elites uh, that are involved are, are being vulnerable to this kind of pressure. As a result, the Moldovan politicians fell into a trap that they seem to willingly go into again before the parliamentary elections. Moldovan politicians got swamped into narrow focused heuds for local control, viewing Russia as a source of funding for their domestic games, and failing to understand that Russian interest is being in taking remote control over Moldova. While these two strategies, controlling people and controlling elites, may be used separately, in Moldova they are used in a combined way, reinforcing the Russian ability to acquire control of Moldovan sovereignty. The third strategy, and a very sensitive one to discuss with the EU interlocutors, is the faking of the Transnistrian conflict resolution by Russia. In the way it is designed, it is supposed to bring a bogus conflict resolution only imitating the achievements of a finality of a peace process. And it represents the metaphorical Russian hook that will keep Moldova hanging, preventing it from breaking ties with the Russian Federation. And those of you who study Russia, you may remember uh, there was a few years interview with the Commerce, uh, when a member of the Russian Secret Service 
was discussing the the feud among the Russian uh, secret services that they were basically setting up each other. So that senior Russian official thank you, used a metaphor that is, I think it's um, it's monumental in explaining the situation in Russia. He basically said that KGB or the Czechists, he called them, was that hook that has caught Russia from free falling and caught it hanging there until it was recovered. And he referred to the disintegration of Russia as a state. And he referred to the Czechist hook as very tough and bloody measures that were explored to keep Russia together, including the Chechen war. So I'm using this met metaphor uh, in case of Moldova as well, referring to the uh, uh, transition conflict resolution uh, as in, in the Russian, uh, by the Russian model. So how is this possible? I claim that Russia explores the historical images of individual European countries, as well as some perceptional errors to present the conflict as being a Moldovan domestic one with inter-ethnic roots. By this, Russia hides the foreign aggression nature of the conflict and insulates itself from the international pressure resulting from that recognition. I also claim that Russia was able to slowly explore the five plus two negotiations format to advance its, its agenda manipulating Western diplomatic and political culture of concession, but also exploring the temptation to, of separate Western actors to create positive interaction with Russia in order to diminish the current Western Russian uh, diplomacy. Uh, the current trend of conflict resolution, which is advanced by OSC and other Western actors in the 5 plus 2 format, not coincidentally aligns well with the Russian vision of the resolution, as I suggested. The, the danger of this approach is that it will only address the conflict cosmetically, but in reality it will stay there with the potential to erupt later. A more immediate effect, though, given the forthcoming parliamentary elections, is that the conflict is explored to augment Russia's efforts to take control of the Moldovan sovereignty. By bringing into the equation the transmission swing border, Russia can ensure a certain success of capturing Moldova as a state. Even if half of the some 220,000 voters from transition region participate in Moldovan elections, they can potentially give a pro-Russian force a constitutional majority in the parliament. And very importantly, Transistra is a source of over 10,000 of Russian-trained combat troops that could be explored to secure or enforce the political gains in Moldova. The other role could be one of political blackmailing, as it already happened in the 1990s, and build a foundation both for the current negotiations format and <coughs> the Moldova neutrality. For comparison, Moldovan National Army combat troops would only reach a couple of thousands. It is important to emphasize that those forces won't be used conventionally, which decreases the cost of violence, but also increases the risk of their use. You'll be able to get more details from the analysis itself. I'd like to finalize by suggesting that out of the number of policy recommendations that I made, there is one that I believe it is critical. The most optimal EU response to the threats Moldova is confronting would be, in my opinion, to deploy a CSDP mission to Moldova to assist Kishinev in preparing to respond to the Russian hybrid aggression. And given that this is not a quick process, naturally, I suggest EU design and implement provisionary assistance mechanisms while the decision for CSDP mission deployment is being taken. This provisional assistance measures would have to help Moldova design and implement operational early warning and early response mechanisms, especially focusing on responding to unorthodox military tactics of the hybrid aggression. The reason for these recommendations come from the understanding of the mechanism of the hybrid aggression. The non-military measures, they prepare the ground usually, but control over the territory and blackmail, uh, political blackmail, comes with the use of military forces, either conventional or in an unorthodox form like the Green Man used in Crimea, or the proxies used in Donbas, which are supposedly local rebels, usually. Moldova needs to first be prepared to disrupt possible use of military forces as the most damaging scenario, and only after this to address the goals of the non-military strategies. Why does a CSDP mission is the minimum um, response to the, uh, that has the highest chances to succeed? The, uh, the response is that Moldova is at the stage of Russian control when it is not able alone anymore to diminish and disrupt the Russian attempt to take over its sovereignty. Its institutions are ineffective 
its political class has its preferences corrupting and altered by the Russia through uh, the mechanism that I discussed, and its relevant expertise to protect against a stealthy foreign aggression is lacking. Since the P mission would serve the function of an improvised martial plan, that would first strengthen the ability of Moldova to resist the use of military forces, then strengthen institutions, and then build resilience. <coughs> I will conclude by saying that assisting Moldova in resisting the Russia's self-aggression is in the bloody interest of the EU itself, as it will improve the chances of EU self-preservation. That concludes my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Dimitri, for your presentation and lots of very interesting observations and recommendations. Uh, you notice that Moldova is next to Ukraine, and you know very often uh, you may hear uh, almost the same but opposite uh, sentence in Ukraine. Uh, there is growing interest to events in Moldova and uh, very often we may hear in Ukraine about threat of so-called Dodonization of Ukraine. So we have lots, lots of things in common, I would say. And now it will be really interesting for us, for all of us, uh, to hear to uh, our colleague from Minsk, from Belarus, Andrei Paratnikov, found the Belarus security blog. Uh, which observations, which results do you find interesting for Belarusian experience and what uh, experience of Belarus in terms of external threats or internal threats might be uh, useful for other participants of Eastern Partnership uh, states. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, at first, I would like to thank the organizers of the opportunity uh, to speak here in the front of you. Uh, we know quite about uh, we know quite well about the problems and challenges uh, to security in Eastern Europe. But uh, here I am representing uh, the Belarusian National Platform of Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum. So uh, I would like to say about uh, the role of uh, civil society in uh, the modern situation and. Uh, uh, in this uh, new uh, uh, world uh, that uh, now uh, exists around us uh, after the Rus uh, Russian aggression uh, against the Ukraine. Uh, my country is often uh, called uh, the last dictatorship of Europe. Uh, this is not uh, really true. Uh, mostly uh, we are some kind of sultanate. Uh, in 1996, our country was privatized uh, by one person. So uh, after that, we have a very strange regime in Belarus. Uh, that is, uh, it's, not, it, it's not the same situation like in uh, Latin America or in uh, Central Asia countries in Belarus. Uh, but at the same time, we have a great dilemma uh, as a civil society representatives uh, who we are in this uh, situation. We are observers or we are an actors and uh, how can we influence uh, at the national security agenda of Belarus? Uh, and can we uh, have any influence uh, in this situation? Uh, what can we do? Uh, in our country. Uh, in fact, uh, quite a lot. Uh, but you need to be realistic uh, and uh, appreciate the ruler not as a person, but as a decision-making uh, mechanism. In our case, we speak about a poorly working mechanism. Uh, we must see the difference between the nation, the state, and the authority. You can criticize and even attack the authority, but uh, in today's condition, you can't attack the nation or the state. Uh, despite the fact that uh, state doesn't belong us as a nation, uh, at the moment, uh, then it uh, uh, when it becomes the property of the nation once again. Uh, it should uh, return to us in the best possible condition. Uh, what uh, is the Sultan uh, afraid of? Losing their power or the state? 
we identify uh, threats of the nation and uh, the state and show them offering the solutions of the authority as far as possible. Uh, if the Sultan is afraid of uh, losing his property, the state, uh, then let him uh, strengthen uh, it and eliminate the threats uh, of its existence. Our think tank uh, works with political opposition and independent media. We have a weekly radio program. Uh, I personally write a column uh, in the country's second uh, largest independent newspaper. And at the same time, it's the fifth uh, largest newspaper among all social and political papers, including state owned ones. Uh, it's even sold in the building of President Administration of Belarus, so it's a, it's a, a channel of influence too, uh, as the authority is there on uh, minds. Uh, our task is to uh, objectively inform the public and uh, counter elite. Uh, those people who are in favor of democratic transit and European choice of Belarus should be uh, competent and adequately uh, assess uh, the security situation. We are um, trying to break uh, the state monopoly on the security sphere of Belarus. Uh, we show that besides the officials and generals, other people uh, can discuss a security problem and uh, propose uh, solutions in this area. Uh, we use uh, the organizational and uh, informational capabilities of, of the political opposition and independent media to identify problems and promote possible solutions. Uh, for example, we managed, uh, we managed to raise the topic of socioeconomic uh, degradation of the regions of Belarus. Uh, also, we started from the east of the country. The topic uh, was picked up uh, by politicals and uh, brought to the national level. Uh, the authorities had to respond and propose a solution, uh, mostly with uh, these are bad solutions. Uh, but before, the authorities uh, didn't uh, think about it at all. Uh, we, be uh, we began to involve uh, Belarusian human rights activists into the problems of national security. Uh, the reason was a number of strange deaths of uh, soldiers in the army. Uh, the generals uh, hide uh, the reasons of these deaths. Uh, so. Uh, in the end of this month, uh, the first uh, forum of human rights and uh, national security uh, will take place in Belarus. Uh, uh, as it seems to me, uh, these are very, very related things, uh, human rights and uh, national security. Uh, we create uh, some part of competition to the authority uh, for countries like Belarus, the agenda of the authorities, uh, authorities uh, is determined not only by the demands uh, within the country, but also from the outside. Uh, we work with uh, foreign embassies of Western countries. Uh, this allows us, uh, with the help of foreign diplomats, to raise the problem that authorities would like to hash up, especially when it comes about repressions. Uh, in the spring of uh, 2017, almost uh, 40 people were arrested on charges uh, of creating an illegal armed organization and preparing terrorist attacks. Uh, state media told uh, lies that these people were preparing uh, an armed uh, rebellion and shahid children uh, for, ex uh, for explosions in the metro of Russian cities. Uh, the point uh, is that uh, uh, at those times, uh, the Belarusian authorities had very bad relations with Moscow. Uh, Lukashenko decided to scare Putin. Uh, he decided to show that uh, Putin should not, that if Putin uh, would not uh, support Lukashenko, uh, then uh, anti-Russian Maidan could happen in Belarus. Uh, the cumulative pressure uh, on the authority from the civil society, independent media, the political opposition, uh, and some, only some foreign countries, uh, has made it possible to secure uh, the release of these people. Uh, I can tell, uh, talk a lot about these topics because okay, we... Thank you a lot, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, yes, but uh, I have a few summary, a few summary. Just conclusions. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we have to be realistic 
and operated uh, and operate with facts, not uh, fantasies. Uh, in such conditions, you have to be a star, not a sprinter. Uh, the situation is changing, but it's uh, not changing as quickly as uh, we would like. Uh, we must look for allies and uh, to be open for building coalitions. It's necessary to work to increase the influence and uh, attract any new supporters of our ideas. And uh, we must not be afraid to compete with the authorities. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, now floor for Hennady Maksak, who is the chairman of Foreign Policy Council Ukraine Prison uh, from Ukraine. Uh, Hennady, what are your uh, viewers on securitization of Eastern Partnership Project and perhaps your assessments of certain ideas which Dmitry talked about, perhaps about CSDP mission in Moldova or even in Ukraine, which was debated several years, years ago in Ukraine as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. It is not debated anymore, and I explain why <laughs> in Ukraine. But uh, to be frank, very interesting paper. Thank you, Dimitri, for, for, for these thoughts. I think they are comprehensive and just lay good background for discussion. I will start with the the first um, idea you you just throw the table through the table that risk assessment failed. I think this was the case with Ukraine when we had a lot of different strategic documents in Ukraine just on the eve of uh, Russian aggression, but no document mentioned Russia as a source of threat for Ukraine. And basically, this is the main uh, idea that there should be uh, more order in terms of strategic documents. And I think here we could also rely on our strategic partners from the United States, from the European Union. Uh, and basically, uh, it was the first task we asked our colleagues when there was Red Corporation in Ukraine. We assessed all the documents we had. We reassessed, we redeveloped national strategy, um, uh, national security strategy, um, military doctrine, uh, informational uh, security strategy, and many others to create uh, an overarching architecture or constellation of the documents, which could further lay the um, ground for the tactical and operational uh, actions we could, we could take. Moldova is the next uh, Ukraine. I think this scenario is quite plausible. And basically, uh, we should also share our experience we have in Ukraine, and we should maybe try to help our Moldovan colleagues where we can with help of uh, on the lateral level, be it on the level of Eastern Partnership, be it the level of the association countries within the Eastern Partnership, or maybe in terms of cooperation with third partner like NATO. Uh, to tell the truth, NATO was the strongest partner when it comes to the security in Ukraine. And basically what we had uh, uh, on the level of uh, operational enhancement of our activity and our capabilities, it was done predominantly with trust funds of, of NATO in Ukraine. And what is uh, quite interesting, it was the recent event in, in Kyiv, which was, was on the umbrella of the Cabinet of Ministers, the conference on countering hybrid threats. And basically it was done under the auspices of the platform between NATO and Ukraine on hybrid threats. I think it could be also be a good platform of for a discussion with our modern colleagues, what the experience so far is there and what we could elaborate as some common initiatives. Uh, what is important to understand that uh, there is a real re regionalization of the uh, Russian stealth aggression, which was put as it was put by our modern colleague. Uh, and our researches we have in, in, in this region, done by some experts who are present now in, in, in this uh, audience, that uh, there are some messages, there are some instruments which are common for different countries. There are some specific for some countries, for Kishinev, for, for Kiev, and for others. But we should try to take uh, common measures when it comes to those which just reiterate in different areas of Eastern Partnership. It could be also a good start for cooperation, on, on hands and cooperation on this level. Uh, when it comes to common initiatives within the association agreement countries, I would say um, for us it would be interesting to counter hybrid threats with experience which is already generated by Central of Excellence for countering hybrid threats in Helsinki. 
there is still an idea to, to join as observer, as a full-fledged participant of, of, the, of this instrument, because I think we should try to be on the edge of the process with European partners and to understand with the same terms, with the same uh, definitions, what's going on and what we could do together. Another uh, idea which was, uh, flo which was floating uh, around discussions uh, in Eastern Partnership, it was the creation of the Center for Cybersecurity in Eastern, uh, uh, Eastern Partnership region. It was basically the idea of Ukraine to create such center re which would be based in Ukraine, but it could share uh, and uh, gather some experience about our potential, what we can do in this domain. And by basically Romania is a good partner in this domain when it comes to Ukraine, I think it also could be shared with our Moldovan counterparts. Uh, also, it would be great to discuss these ideas more in depth on intergovernmental level uh, in multilateral fora of Eastern Partnership. Still, I think it is a uh, quite relevant idea and quite well point to create, if not platform, I think it's quite uh, impossible at the moment um, political wise, but I think we could create a special working group, expert working group, which is part of this multilateral setup to deal with hybrid threats and try to, to pursue this, uh, this issue on the agenda of, of the Eastern Partnership. Uh, I will skip to, to the common initiatives uh, bilateral with Ukraine. What I think is quite important that there is a very big uh, Ukrainian minority or diaspora in, in Moldova, which unfortunately plays into hands of Russia because it's Russian speaking, because it's uh, heavily reliant uh, on, on Russian media. And I think in, the, in, in, the, in this direction, we could try to find out on the but on the level of civil society, how to uh, create more possibilities for a very interesting campaigns, for uh, resilience when it comes to media, for uh, media literacy. I think in long run, it could it, it could be a good, a good a good choice for us. Another point which is worth of mentioning in in this audience, it is a strengthening of Ukrainian media presence in Moldova. Just to counterbalance some of Russian, Russian influence. It is quite difficult. We do understand this, the potential of Russian media, Russian media products, entertaining, entertaining products is different from what we have in Ukraine, but still we're trying to, to catch up with that. And uh, what is good news that uh, Ukrainian um, foreign uh, broadcaster, or I don't know, uh, external broadcaster UATV is trying to get on cables to, to, to be transmitted in Moldova. I think it's not of the same scale as Russians are in, in, in the region, in, in country, but still I think it's a good step and we should try to expand this activity. Um, and I'll try to address some of your recommendations uh, as you pointed out in, in your paper. Since the permission, I think it's a very good idea, but uh, in terms of practicality, I think it's next to impossible to, to launch in, 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 in other shape as we have EU bump, for example, at the moment. Uh, in Ukraine, we asked for, for, for not for advisory mission when, when it was at the outset of this conflict. We asked for mission of, of, of those who can observe the conflict on the east of Ukraine. But internal uh, European discussion disputes made it only in that way. We're grateful for all the help we have in this direction, but it's only the hint from Ukrainian side that uh, CCP mission is not uh, that uh, easy fruit, low-hanging low fruit for, for, for our countries. Another issue which you mentioned, um, EU, Moldova, bilateral formats of cooperation in preparing to counter um, threats, hybrid threats. I think Ukraine could be a good partner in, in, this, in, in this format because we have a lot of experience how to counter the threats on the ground when it comes to occupied territories, when it comes to uh, controlled territories. And uh, so I think it could be trilaterally done with the... Um, either with this uh, center of excellence of for hybrid threats or in just other formats. Uh, you mentioned uh, cooperation with Transnistria, or with, Ukraine, with Ukraine on Transnistria and trying to just to uh, eliminate this risk from, from this region. I think we should expand to other spheres as well and to border control, which is quite important for us. And I think in, in terms of con border control, EU bomb still is relevant partner for us to have uh, it's a submission on, on this territory. Thank you, Kanagi. Okay, maybe for the discussion Thank there'll you. be some other uh, I would like uh, to introduce Kamil um, Tsaus, Senior Research Fellow from the Center for Eastern Studies from Poland, from Warsaw, 
uh, it will be really interesting to listen to your suggestions or forecast how EU policies uh, might be changed, taking into account certain uh, recommendations, observations, which we are hearing today. Uh, or you do not see any perspective, any room for changes uh, in the EU in the nearest time? Thank you very much. Good day, uh, everybody. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm really happy to see so many familiar and even more happy to see unfamiliar faces here because networking is a very important uh, thing on such events. And that's why I would like to join the choir of those who praise organizers for this event. So thank you very much. Uh, indeed, and thank you, Dimitru, for uh, for this very comprehensive and uh, and deep paper. Um, I will try to answer those questions which were uh, given just a second ago in a moment. But first of all, I would like to say that I do agree with almost all the general points made by uh, Dimitru in his paper. Obviously, Russia is using instruments and mechanism of hybrid warfare against Moldova, against not only Moldova, against countries in the region and even outside the region. But at the same time, I would like to attract your attention uh, to the fact, or, or maybe to argue uh, a little bit controversially, uh, that the potential of Russian influence on Moldova, this traditional influence, uh, in the last year, it's actually diminishing and not uh, and not rising. And by the last year, as I mean, the, well, the time since uh, 2013, uh, 2014. And this is due to the fact that Russia overused, misused, somehow depleted this huge uh, potential it had in Moldova. And don't get me wrong, it's still vast, it's still there. There are also new kinds of uh, influences that Russia is trying developing, and we heard uh, heard about this here. But let's let's take a brief look on those traditional instruments Russia is using, and we will and we will see this. So first one is obviously trade, and uh, Dmitry was also referring to this topic, uh, talking this topic a little bit. And this is the instrument which suffered probably in the greatest way uh, because of this extensive use or because of this misuse, and it's enough to compare certain digits. So let's start from the, the main one. So in the, if in 2013, the total export to Russia from Moldova equaled $655 million, more or less, and it represented 27% of the total Moldovan export, then in 2017, uh, it decreased. Well, 2017 was actually the year when it started to increase again, but just slightly, uh, to only 254.5 million, which is 10%. So it's 70% point smaller uh, share of the total exports than it than it used to be uh, before 2013. And what's important in this context is the fact that in 2017 Moldova managed to restore the export level from 2013. So basically Moldova changed the export map, changed the scheme of export, uh, while exporting as much as before, uh, before the moment when Russia introduced sanctions, and it was in 2013 and in 2014, and it was related to the fact that Moldova signed an association agreement, or was preparing to sign an association agreement. And what's even more important, Moldova exports more products of animal origin, more vegetables than before the sanctions right now. The only problem is with the, is with the alcohol. Uh, Moldova did not managed to restore the export level from the pre-sanctioned time, but it's already negligible. It's about $8 million. Uh, $8 million. So this is the first thing. So the second, uh, and I promise to skip to my time frame. Uh, second instrument is uh, migration. And here, losses for Russia are also considerable. Um, if in 2013, about, say, 68% of all remittances uh, came from Russia to Moldova and amounted to over $1 billion, then in 2017, it dropped by $600 million to about $400 million, which represents merely 33%. Uh, so it's, again, like twice as twice time smaller. And of course, this doesn't mean that Moldovan migration was massively redirected to the other countries. It doesn't mean that Moldovan migrants, like half of Moldovan migrants, left Russia. It's also to a certain extent related to the fact that Russian rubble dropped. Uh, depreciated uh, considerably, but nevertheless, this instrument stopped to be as powerful as it was before, also because it was used. And the third instrument is energy, and here, of course, situation not as optimistic, uh, but if we'll try to look for any positives. Um, 
we will see that those threats which, which Russia was using when it comes to energy and is using constantly, um, as never before, managed to mobilize Moldovan authorities to tackle the problem of energy, the energy independence when it, comes to, when it comes to gas. And of course, I know about all the problems regarding re gaining independence from, from Russian sources when it comes to gas. And of course, one of the biggest obstacles in this is not outside, it's not in Russia, it's in Moldova and in Kishinev. Uh, but still, if we will compare situation today to the situation uh, in 2013, we do have Ungeni Ash um, interconnector in place. Of course, it's not working, but it is there. It was built. Uh, we are moving forward slowly, but somehow steady, uh, with the pipeline from Ungeni to Kishinev. Um, and well. It's still not there. Of course, there is still the problem of deadline of 2020 when the gas, the contract will will uh, expire with Russia currently, and when Moldova should implement the third package. But still, Moldova is as close as never before to obtaining energy independence from when it comes to gas from Russia. And this is also thanks to the fact that that Russia was using this instrument for a longer period of time. And let me also argued that uh, Russia overused all those instruments without any real tangible profit and without gaining anything really uh, worth it. Uh, and one may argue, of course, that th th this uh, influenced social moods, that it's uh, increased the support from the, for the pro-Russian forces, that it's increased support for Dodon, or maybe even uh, allowed him to, to win at some point. Uh, but I would rather argue that all those things are an effect of an internal situation of the policy of the ruling, then ruling coalition or the ruling government right now, and not really the Russian actions. And on the other hand, it's a victory of Dodon, who is really rather subordinated to Pohatnyuk, not to Moscow directly, is such a victory for Moscow. I mean, that's, that's arguable. And the last thing, um, there's also one more issue, which, which shall be perceived as a Russia fi failure, and it was somehow already debated here, and it's the ultra high, uh, historical, I think, um, in case of Moldova, polarization of Moldovan society. I mean, currently we've got about 50-50 split when it comes to geopolitical preferences of Moldovans, more or less, of course. And both electorates are very stable, they are concrete, it's really hard to imagine any transfers from one of those groups to the other. Uh, and. From the perspective of Russia, this can be perceived as a kind of failure, as kind of a deterioration of the situation. If you will compare this to the situation in the mid 2000s, for example, we will see that then it was really possible to have about 70 to 80 percent population more or less pro-Russian or views or, or views which were like uh, we should be more with Russia compared to Russia. Right now, it's no longer possible. So. I'd, just to wrap it up, I would argue that Russian instruments of pressure on Moldova are not permanent. Moscow is losing its grip on this country when it comes to those traditional instruments. Uh, and it's fully aware of that, which can push Kremlin to uh, actions um, which would be aimed at changing the situation. And this is to a large extent what, what Dumitru was speaking about. So I'm, 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 I'm in line with, with him. And I will, to, just to finalize just two sentences, I would like to also pick up to what Victoria uh, Bukhtaru said, uh, not only she, but, but she was the first one probably, that threats for Moldova are not originating only from outside. And uh, actually the biggest threat for Moldova, for Moldovan security, for, for Moldovan statehood, statehood are inside, are uh, coming from the current political elites and the actions of this elite, the corruption, the oligarchization, the relations between this elite and the, for example, Transnistrian elite, but also certain connections with Russia, those are the things which make Moldova most vulnerable to Russian influences and which are creating another doors, as Dmitry put it, to this room where, where which Moldova is. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Anna Otilia Nutsu a member of the steering committee of the Eastern Partnership Civil Society Forum, expert forum, uh, Bucharest. Uh, what is your vision on security in Eastern Partnership, and in particular in terms of possible uh, changes in EU's policies to Eastern Partnership, and in particular, when Romania will get uh, presidency? Uh, maybe you see uh, the uh, ways, mechanism, 
uh, how to amend uh, current stance of Romanian diplomacy with regards to Eastern partnership, maybe somehow to strengthen it, in particular to take more attention to security issues to the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you also for organizing uh, this uh, wonderful event. Uh, and um, before going uh, to, uh, to Dimitri's paper, I would like also to thank Camille for opening up so nicely to my, uh, <laughs> to my presentation about uh, which focuses mostly on energy. I'd like to uh, thank you for, uh, for your paper and to take up from one of your last remarks, which I liked very much, about uh, how the EU should bloody care of, of what happens in Moldova because uh, it really affects uh, security also inside the EU. Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, security, I'm looking only at energy. Uh, so uh, there are certain developments here which are really relevant uh, for the security uh, and for the governance uh, inside the EU. And I would like to bring up uh, one of the recent situations uh, which uh, is happening now in Transnistria. Uh, you know that uh, Moldova right now imports all of its gas from Gazprom, but most of this gas is being used to, to produce electricity in Transnistria. Uh, that gas is being not paid for. Um, a part of the money uh, is actually used to support the so-called uh, government of Transnistria. Part of the money is siphoned off in various schemes. Until recently, it was through certain offshore companies. Uh, right now, the latest uh, idea was to develop a Bitcoin, in, uh, Bitcoin uh, mining factory, which is, uh, in fact, uh, owned uh, apparently by the son of the general prosecutor of Russia. So what happens there is that uh, the money, uh, which is being actually siphoned off from Gazprom, from the Russian uh, taxpayer, in fact, uh, is being laundered in Transnistria by transforming it into bitcoins. Uh, and that would, in theory, uh, be able to increase Moldova's uh, total debt to Gazprom uh, up to 800 or 900 million dollars a year. So right now, Moldova's total debt to Gazprom is, uh, amounts to the total country GDP. Uh, the, which is about seven, seven billion. If you increase that by almost one billion yearly, uh, you can imagine what, uh, what happens. Uh, that Bitcoin, which is being produced, uh, is, uh, has also popped up in, uh, financing uh, various schemes. Uh, for example, uh, the meddling in the U.S. elections apparently was partly funded through Bitcoins. So this is not irrelevant for the EU as well. Uh, right now, there is uh, certain evidence that, uh, well, uh, this uh, power plant in Transnistria doesn't use its uh, full capacity to produce bitcoins, uh, but um, uh, it uses only about 5% of the total capacity, but it can increase uh, substantially, like uh, 2.4 gigawatt, it can, uh, it can increase. So, uh, this is highly relevant and it has to be stopped. Uh, now, um, about uh, Romania's priorities um, uh, for the Eastern Partnership, uh, I care very little about the political statements and what we say that we want to do. Uh, what matters is what we actually do. So we could stop this nonsense by simply accelerating the interconnection uh, with, uh, with Moldova on gas and also uh, reducing this dependence on Russian gas separating th completely the debt of uh, the Russian company, uh, which is this uh, power plant in, uh, uh, in Transnistria, from the debt of Moldova, and simply doing the things as they are supposed to be uh, done in a country that respects fully the uh, EU directives, because Moldova on energy has to respect the EU directives. Uh, instead of that, we don't really speed up the interconnections. Uh, we are supposed to do uh, the works both in Romania and in Moldova uh, to finalize this pipeline, which uh, right now is just a bit of uh, gas pipeline which goes from nowhere to nowhere, so it practically isn't an alternative. Uh, but uh, despite the fact that we are supposed to finalize the... the uh, so Transgas, our Romanian company, is also building the pipeline in Moldova. Uh, uh, contractually, it was supposed to finalize, uh, finalize it by next year, uh, I haven't seen much done, 
And the Romanian government has actually uh, cut uh, almost entirely the possibility of Transgas to do the investment by taking as dividends to the state budget 90% of the profit of the company. So uh, I don't really care about uh, how we come out with the statements that we uh, want to help the Eastern Partnership and of course Moldova with whom we have uh, uh, special connections. What I care is whether we, uh, we go ahead or not. And I'll uh, stop here because probably there will be a lot of questions uh, to respond to. Thank you a lot, very much. And dear participants, you're very welcome. Uh, Leolita, please. Thank you. I have two questions, uh, one for Dumitru and one for uh, Anna Otilia. Uh, Dumitru, the, there was a discussion about the fact that the Russians might be interested in uh, solving the Transnistrian conflict for showing openness uh, to the external partners, easing the sanctions then, and uh, claiming that uh, you know, we solved the, the conflict in Transnistria because the Moldovans are sober and they wanted to do this, but Ukrainians are not, so we are not able to solve that in Ukraine. So would this uh, be a real scenario? Is this discussed from your perspective and could this happen uh, in general? And the second question regarding that energy, I'm not m very much into this, but uh, I was told at some point that uh, uh, technically the Moldovan debt to the Russian Gazprom is a uh, Russian debt to a Russian company because apparently um, uh, for Moldova Gas is owned by uh, Gazprom, so technically Moldova doesn't have any debt. How would you assess this action? Thank you. Thank you, Stanislav Skreru, USS, and thank you for an excellent uh, panel. It was a pleasure to listen to every one of you. Uh, I would like a bit to push back on Dimitri's arguments and then to ask you two questions. Um, first one, I think people in Transnistria, especially leadership of Transnistria, is not that happy to turn into the terrain of a military conflict, uh, especially when they export 70% of the goods to European market and not to Russian market. Uh, it's actually quite difficult for them to access Russian market because of corruption. This is what you hear from uh, the system uh, uh, the business people. Uh, and that's why probably they were very cooperative and were leaking some information to Ukrainian relevant bodies in 2014 about Russian plans in uh, Odessa and other southern regions. So uh, I would say that Transnistrians will try to sabotage any kind of uh, Russian plan while going probably officially along with uh, Russians, but uh, behind the uh, curtain they will try to sabotage this effort because they don't want to turn to the uh, conflict area. Uh, second thing, um, you've mentioned Russian tools or uh, using economic tools in order to mobilize uh, Moldovan society, to mobilize some protests. But if I look uh, since 2013, 14, all the Russian measures, uh, tariffs and uh, wine embargo didn't actually generate, trigger the genuine protests in the Moldovan society. There were fake protests yeah, of uh, some uh, people claiming that they're representing the uh, agricultural sector, but mostly all the protests were generally social and were demanding investigation, rule of law, corruption, but not about uh, tariffs or uh, salaries. Uh, and then, then uh, something on the captured institutions. Uh, the fact that some institutions or institutions in Moldova are captured doesn't mean that they are dysfunctional. Uh, and it's not to protect this kind of model of governance, but when oligarch or oligarchs need these institutions perform their security or economic functions. And when I say this, I'm thinking what happened in 2014 and how intelligence service, for, for my surprise, was pretty uh, pretty efficient in tackling the threat in the Gulf. Yeah. Uh, and um, I think uh, on, on the questions which I'd like to raise, uh, first one for, for Hennady. So in case of the potential Donbass scenario in Moldova, could you imagine and to describe what would be a reaction of Ukraine? 
Uh, and for Dmitro, since Russia is controlling politically or captured political institutions in political class in Moldova and have such a big economic cloud, why would they would go for the next stage, which is more expensive and costly? Why not to enjoy what they have now in terms of political and economic control? So why to go for a much more expensive approach in uh, Moldova? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, the, for the time and thank you for your uh, opinions. I, uh, for the last two years, I, I'm going frequently on, uh, in Chisinau. I have a lot of friends there. I have uh, a lot of contacts. But uh, what I'm, I'm going to ask is, uh, let's say, a, a think of mine, an idea of mine. How will it be, what impact shall uh, have that uh, the only Romanian state-owned bank Czech bank, uh, what impact will uh, will have to cross the uh, to cross into in, uh, Moldova and be part of uh, the banking system there? Thank you. Uh, I have both reactions to the comments of the panelists and the questions, but I'll start with the questions. So if you have time, I'll, uh, I'll uh, reflect on the panelists' uh, um, remarks. So, um, Russia may be interested to solve the conflict to show an example. Could this happen? Is it real? Um, this, uh, we have been discussing, I used to work for the government. I had actually twice I worked for the government. One was from 98 to 2004, and another was recently uh, in uh, the beginning of 2018. Uh, we were discussing that opportunity for Russia to show an example uh, and get uh, a political image, international image, uh, in late 90s, early 2000 already. And uh, it was met with irony by the Russians. Uh, the, I, I think we have to look at the interest. What, why this conflict was created in the first place. That's why in, in my research, in my paper analysis, I suggested that we, we have this step back, we have this helicopter view on what is going on. We don't get focused on actions, uh, but we do look at the goal. What is the goal? Because if we do this, then we can actually see different actions how lead to the same goal. And this is useful when we design public policies. So Russia is not interested in Transnistria as an example for other things. And, and for instance, you can listen to Dmitry Trenin and others that say, oh, you know, the Transnistria is not important for Russians. But this is not true. If you look at the uh, Russian military analysts and, and the security analysts, uh, and if you discuss with them, not for the public sake, but you know, kind of a more uh, close discussion, uh, they view Transnistrian conflict as a entry point for recovering the influence, for reestablishing a, a model of control that Soviet Union had over this area. It is not by, dis by, by accident that President Putin said that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 21st uh, uh, century. Uh, and if you talk to uh, psychologists uh, that, you know, that they have analyzed this kind of a statements of Putin, they would suggest that perhaps Putin has a legacy. He views his legacy as a president uh, and he wants to leave uh, as his place in history, to have his place in Russian history as recovering that influence that Soviet Union had and may not necessarily be in the same form. You don't have, in today's world, you don't have to be able to, you know, roll your troops over the border to control the territory in order to, to claim control. You can do it indirectly at a lower cost, like, uh, you know, Kyrgyzstan, for instance. It's an independent country, but it's so much dependent on, on Russia. Um, so I don't think they are interested to show an example. And this is one of the, uh, I think, the failures of, of uh, German government, who is pushing very much this same idea in the five plus two talks uh, in, uh, as, as, as we speak. Uh, the, the goal of Russia, as I see it, is to recover to what I refer to as taking control of the Moldovan sovereignty, but indirectly. So de facto Moldova would look like an independent country, but the Yuri, the, the Yuri it would be a, a, a satellite state, it would be subordinate. 
will vote for Russian international institutions, uh, it would support Russian initiatives, so it will basically help Russia to undermine the current rule-based order that the uh, U.S. Is, uh, uh, has been uh, guarding for so many years. So I, I just don't think this is possible. Uh, people, leaders in Transnistria are not happy to go into military conflict, exploiting 70% of the EU market. Um, I, I agree with the, that, that that was the case, actually. That was one of the arguments I was making a few years back, before, before Ukraine. Uh, however, what happened after this uh, incident, when the Russians learned that some of the Transnistrian elites communicated to Ukraine their plans, uh, they actually uh, took uh, uh, measures to prevent that in the future. So I agree that local elites are not interested in a conflict because they looked at the Donbas, how everything was destroyed, industries were evacuated to Russia and so on, so capital were, were lost. Um, the problem is, and this is the argument I was making uh, as a state secretary, that because of the Russian military presence in the region, they act as a constraint on the local elites. They cannot resist because they can be imprisoned, uh, you know, uh, penal cases can be generated against them, and where do they go? So uh, as long as there is a Russian military presence there with the security apparatus, the local elites, even they, they would like to negotiate with Moldova and the West in good faith, they cannot do that because they are, they are just uh, uh, too much vulnerable uh, to Russian pressure. So I think, yes, I agree this dynamic is in place, but I think the Russians have learned the lesson and they have effective mechanism in place to constrain the, uh, the local elites. Uh, all tariffs of Russia did not generate protest, nor the effect we involved. Um, I, I believe uh, my argument could have been misunderstood. What I describe as a replacement of values I looked at the basically a psychological process that is called uh, preferences and beliefs formations. So imagine you have a person with, with a set of preferences, uh, and I, I pointed it out. Let's say you are in a democratic country where these people, uh, United States, where individual uh, values are on the top of the preference of the ranking of preferences, right? So psychologists say that we as humans we value many things, but we usually have a single pick preference. So we have a ranking, which, you know, we prefer first, let's say, uh, banana ice cream more than chocolate ice cream and so on. So we, we want to go to the second if we cannot get the first one. That's, that's how, you know, uh, that's the science about it. Uh, so how do we move somebody to, from one choice to another? We can do it by changing the environment. If somebody likes banana ice cream in the top and they will pick it if there was existence, if you remove it from the choice list, they will go for the first preferences. If we remove the second one, they will go for the third one. So the logic is that also, uh, and then we, we go into some other uh, social research like uh, uh, the uh, muscle pyramid of needs, we, where we, we suggest that if we are in a very scarce, in an environment of scarce resources, our first instinct would be to defend, let's say, our survival. Like people in Syria, uh, if you suggest, if they are hungry, and you suggest to them a bar of gold and, you know, some food so that their kids, or some medicine to, to protect their kids, they will reject the gold and they will pick up the food, which is because, well, in, in, in our environment, they, the other, other choice would be uh, logical. And, and therefore, what I was arguing, that because Russians have a penetration of the Moldovan market and the ability to change the environment of the people, they can affect the needs. Affecting the needs, they affect preferences next, and, and then, because the preferences are affected, they change the values. So somebody who opted yesterday for individual freedom today because the environment of change and they need to survive, they will opt for stability and, you know, some bread. And even if the Russians roll with the tanks over the border, if they have the bread that yesterday they didn't, they would say, okay, I can leave with that for now. That was the, uh, the, the rationale behind it. Um, and so that, that was uh, my argument that is Russians by those tariffs, economic sanctions, they affected, and in, in, the, in the research I give details in the paper itself. I point out that uh, agricultural sector is one that suffered mostly. And if you watch Moldovan TV today, you see uh, very painful messages of hundreds of tons of apples laying on the ground. You see basically huge piles of apples laying on the ground and perishing because those farmers, they could not export them. And, and they have lost a lot of investments. And not only they are affected, but people that watch this are affected as well. 
So uh, by statistics, according to the data that I'm aware of, about 30% of the working uh, of the workforce is somehow involved in their agriculture. And then another 10 to 15 are involved in the industry that and transportation that support the agriculture. That would suggest from 30 to 50 percent of the Moldovan workforce are dependent on that. And that is usually this uh, uh, the borders that are affected by Russian uh, economic sanctions indirectly. So when the dawn comes from Moscow with those piles on the ground of, of apples and say, uh, you know what, I just uh, negotiated with the Russians, they're going to decrease the tariffs. And you would be able to explore, to explore that. Then the people who were moved on the pyramid of needs from the valuing individual freedoms, they were moved into not having what to feed their family with. They would opt as a short-term solution to sell their apples for now. And that would affect their vote in elections. I mean, that's science. It's it just how usually things work. And you could point out to exception, but we can engage in this debate. That was my, basically my argument. Um, the fact that institutions are captured does not mean they are dysfunctional. Fully agree. Uh, in fact, in many authoritarian countries which have dysfunctional institutions, they're very effective in protecting the authoritarian themselves. Uh, but here I'm talking about they being functional in protecting the state, not the autocrat, right? Somebody made the difference between the sultan, the state, the nation. I, I think that's a, it's a, it's a brilliant uh, uh, description. Uh, because you have basically somebody who has made out of the country their personal business. They run a country like it's a company. And then their interest is not in preserving the sovereignty of the country. Their interest is to preserve the control over the economic uh, and financial uh, uh, circulation, fl fl the, fl the flux of, of money that is in the country. And if an external actors with ability to, to create, uh, 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 you know, those pressures. If they threaten the ability of uh, of the oligarch, of the sultan, uh, to control those economic uh, resources, then they will give up certain things to do that. I think I closed the questions. So uh, in this case, uh, it does not really matter, actually. So what I'm saying, it does not really matter that institutions, in, under some conditions, they uh, uh, can operate. They usually <coughs> operate uh, against uh, threats that are not very serious. If they're more sophisticated, they fail to, to, to do their job. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you very much for this question. It's actually a very important question, and it uh, keeps appearing uh, whenever we discuss about, uh, about this issue. Um, and we shouldn't get uh, lost into details. In fact, yes, technically it's a debt of a commercial company to another commercial company. It has nothing to do this, with the state, and we all know that Gazprom has nothing to do with uh, the Russian state. Yeah, Like Moldova Gas doesn't have anything to do with the Moldovan state and the Russian state. But um, in, in fact, if you look at the effect, is it is as if Moldova owes this amount of money to Gazprom, full stop. Uh, in what sense? In the sense that uh, Gazprom, in theory, could ask for the debt, and if the country cannot pay the debt, it could see some assets in exchange for that debt. For example, to gain control over other infrastructure. Yes, in, in theory, this is uh, uh, how, how would you repay that debt uh, if, uh, if not uh, by uh, uh, something like this? Uh, so, yes, uh, also it's very important to mention that, of course, all these deals couldn't happen uh, without the collusion uh, of uh, people in Chisinau with people in uh, Moscow and with people in Transnistria. Because, for example, Moldova Gas uh, is a company registered in Chisinau, uh, which is owned uh, only 50% by Gazprom. So Gazprom says every time that, oh, we don't control Moldova Gas. We just have 50%. We would need 50% plus one. Um, but uh, the, uh, at the same time, the, uh, the Chisinau government doesn't uh, control it because uh, we, don't, uh, we own only 33%. Uh, but at the same time, they have the power to appoint the CEO. 
Um, at the same time, although Akishino doesn't acknowledge the authorities, the so-called authorities in Transnistria, but they don't have a problem in being co-owners with the Transnistrian so-called government in Moldova Gas. How do you explain this? Yes. Um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, this deal with, um, uh, with the bitcoins happened fully under the eyes of the Chisinau uh, government uh, because, uh, well, um, the Bitcoin mining is uh, legal in so-called Transnistria by a law issued by the so-called uh, Transnistrian uh, authorities. But at the same time, this uh, equipment has passed through the Moldovan customs. Yes. so. All these things, of course, need the collusion of everybody with everybody. And this is why it is possible. And this is why it's very uh, difficult to stop it uh, if there is actually no political will to, to do so from, uh, from Kishino. So practically, it has nothing to do with commercial relations. Um, a company wouldn't ever accept not to be paid for 20 years like Gazprom except not to be paid for 20 years uh, by uh, yes yes so uh, we should uh, simply look at the effects and not uh, the i don't know the scriptic details of the okay. yeah. If I understood correctly, is the question of Stanislav if uh, the Donbass scenario was to uh, unfold on the territory of Moldova, presumably in Cantonese region, what would be the direction of official Kiev? I wish it, it was only imaginary exercise, uh, but I think that uh, the direction would be different as we had in 2008, when there was a uh, uh, Russian Georgian war in full sway. Uh, for several points, the first one, uh, there would be alignment with European and with Euro Atlantic uh, political attitude to this, to this conflict and this situation. But in terms of practic practical assistance, I think that we have more possibilities and more freedoms. We are no longer rely on Russia in our decision making as, as it was in 2008, because we looked at Russia when we tried to make some political declarations and some practical steps. And from other hand, we unfortunately, we are not part of some um, alliance just to have a common decision making. So basically, if there is a kind of legitimate request from Kishinev about military assistance, I think we understand what it is and how important it is. So I think Ukraine could deliver, and as um, it goes, as I was saying, that border control and uh, border security would be enhanced. This is my take on that. So unfortunately, our time is over. If you wish, we may still time from coffee break. But I guess it is better to continue our talk informally uh, during coffee drinking. And uh, so thank you very much for a great debate, for a great discussion. And you're very welcome to coffee drinking and to the next panel devoted to Ukraine. Thanks a lot. <laughs>